All right. So our first speaker in the next session is Professor Krista Loach. And you've already met her this morning. She's Associate Director for the Institute for Software Research. And a lot of you know her from her work in programming languages like SFJ or her recent book on uh, programming styles, exercises in programming styles. And uh, she's here to talk about a lot of work she's been doing in uh, mining software repositories and the implications of that. All right, welcome Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try to shout to my best impersonation of when I teach the large uh, information retrieval <coughs> course in a, a, a large room without microphone. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that my uh, group is doing on, uh, that involves basically large, large, large data. And uh, this is partially supported by a grant from DARPA on mining um, and understanding software enclaves, that's the Muse project, and the idea there, the, the, the whole uh, tenet of that project is that there's so much code out there that uh, uh, let's see how we could use that code for doing all sorts of interesting advanced things like, for example, program repair or uh, program synthesis or, you know, at the very least, like search, code search of some sort, and all sorts of tools, like tools like Owen was mentioning, for example, of trying to track <coughs> who's using my, who's using my project. So we, uh, 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 there's two, I'm going to talk about two <coughs> projects um, in particular. There's another one that I can talk to you about, but these are all projects that my students are working on. Oh. One is a, a study of code cloning in uh, Java, C++, <coughs> Python, and JavaScript. And this is the collaboration with Young Tech at Northeastern. And another uh, project that I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. is uh, uh, the Java build framework, something that we uh, have developed to be able to compile thousands of projects of unknown origins and uh, of which, which of course will be missing the dependencies. So let me, let me talk about, I'll talk about these two projects, but then what I really want at the end is to reflect on what it means to, to do research with so much data and, and in particular research, not develop. We know that the companies have a lot of data and they have to process all the data to do all sorts of business analytics. <coughs> the question is why would we want to do the same thing in research and, uh, and why not? Uh, and that's a, an interesting question that I have been debating myself. Uh, so let me talk about c the code duplication study. And this was basically, we wanted to, well, it was something that we weren't necessarily wanting to do, it just hit us in the face. We could not avoid it. We had to go there. Uh, but the idea is that we were, we were looking at these very large code bases like GitHub, the entirety of GitHub, right? And we wanted to do analytics on it. Uh, we wanted to develop tools. But the first thing that came, that popped up immediately, that seemed to be a lot of duplication. And we weren't sure exactly what that lot was. Was it 10%, 20%? We weren't sure. So, the, but it was clear, it, we, we were seeing, even without doing si uh, systematic studies, we were already seeing that there was duplication. So it was necessary to go in and actually find out how much duplication there was. So this is a, a subject we did. This is the corpus. Uh, if you just uh, focus on the bold ones here, <coughs> it's uh, the, the data that we ended up analyzing. So for Java, it's about 470,000 projects. Um, C++, 364,000. Python, it's almost 900,000. And Java, it's about 900,000. This is a sub <coughs> subset of the entirety of the projects in GitHub. And these are, uh, we focus on the, you know that GitHub has that very nice feature of, of Git in general, which is a fork, right? You can fork a project. So we obviously did not want to include the forked projects because those are, by definition, clones of, of the, so these are, what we analyze are projects that are not forked, so that are supposed to be original. Um, <coughs> this is basically the number of files analyzed so about 30 million Java files, 61, 62 million C++, 31 million Python, 135 million in JavaScript. So this is very massive data sets. In fact, uh, just to give an idea, we have these here hosted in one of my servers. It's about, 
I have an eight terabyte hard drive that contains the C++ projects and the Python projects. So an eight terabytes just for half of, of this. So it, this is a very, very large amount of data, especially for research. Um, so what we did next is, so the goal here was to find duplicates. And we wanted to find duplicates at different levels of granularity. We started at the file level. So which files are duplicated? <laughs> and then we, we went one level up. Uh, okay, so let's look at the projects. And now let's see how many uh, files overlap between each project. Uh, so that, that was, those are the two questions. Now the, the levels of similarity, we have different uh, questions of similarity. Let me uh, spend a little bit when I explain the, the this is our pipeline. But basically what you, what you need to do is that the first level of similarity is the most brain dead is file hash, right? Just the equality of the files, exact equality. The second level of similarity is, well, they're not exactly the same, but the source code is the same. So basically ignore comments, ignore white space, ignore maybe the separators, just look at like the actual code and hash that and that's what we call the tokens hash. Okay, so it's, it's like uh, the token <coughs> similarity. And, and then there's a third level of uh, near, si near um, uh, similarity, which is that we allow for certain things to change. Certain identifiers have changed. And we over so we, we have developed a tool that's called Sorcerer CC uh, that is a clone detector uh, that uh, de um, detects near similarity. So we have a, it's a whole talk that I could give in fact, it's the topic of a PhD, one of my PhD uh, students who graduated last year on how that tool works. But basically, it allows for certain uh, variation. Uh, it's not as simple as just hashing things. So those are the three, similar, three types of similarity that we were looking at. And just so that you see, the, this is the result, the end result. Let me tell you what this means. This is the, the, diff the four ecosystems, Java, C++, Python, JavaScript. And let me tell you what this map means. These maps, the horizontal lines are the number of um, <coughs> files, uh, number of files uh, that the projects have. So going up, the projects have more files. Okay? And uh, the uh, <coughs> vertical axis is the number of commits. So up <coughs> means that the project is more active, has had more commits over the, over the years. So and the heat map here, the, the heat value is uh, how much duplication is there, how many files are duplicated in the project. And stronger means that there are more. So sort of a, a kind of a pattern that we see emerging here is that projects that have more files also have more duplicate files, which it kind of makes sense. And also, in a little bit, you can see the pattern, especially here, is that the projects that have more, uh, that have less commits, also have more duplication. Okay, so this is sort of gives you a higher, an order of approximation. If you would like to stay away from duplication, you probably want to be like somewhere in here. Uh, but so this is sort of the map. But let me give you a chart that actually show what happens, what we found out for file duplication. Okay, we we were expecting to see duplication. We were not expecting to see the amount of duplication that we found. It's just completely, oh, oh, oh like we, our minds were blo uh, oh, we blo blown. Away. <laughs> so in Java, uh, basically, um, what this means is that these are the <coughs> duplicate files. Okay, so darker means duplication. So basically, in, dar in Java, there's about 50 something, I don't remember the, the number exactly, 57% or something, uh, are sort of, they, they pass the file hash, okay? So basically 40 something of those files are actually duplicates, exact duplicates in Java. Uh, same, uh, Python is the other way around, it's like 67% of the files in, in Python are exact duplicates. Okay. And in uh, C++ is like another <coughs> 60 something, uh, in the upper 60s are duplicates. Exactly, this is the file hash duplicate. And JavaScript is completely out of the charts. In JavaScript, in fact, only 7% of the files in JavaScript and GitHub are actually non, not duplicates. It's like, what? 
what the hell is happening with the JavaScript ecosystem, right? And now if you zoom in, uh, so this is uh, uh, what you see here is the new duplicate. So this is the sorceress you see. So th that tool that we have that uh, checks for new duplication, so it allows certain variation of certain identifiers. So these are files that are almost the same. So basically, uh, these are, th there's a fair amount of files that are almost the same. So the whites are the ones that we didn't find anything like it, okay? Which is very small percentage of, of the entire thing. <laughs> so, th so there's a lot of duplication. And, and JavaScript is, is completely uh, off the charts. Now, we looked into why. In fact, we did a qualitative analysis. We just went in and kind of selected certain projects to find out. Uh, in particular for JavaScript, because it was so different. And it turns out that uh, in JavaScript, the, thing that, the things that are being most duplicated everywhere are the libraries um, that people use for Node.js. For those of you who use JavaScript, Node.js is a very dominant framework. And there's a bunch of libraries. And so because there is no, nothing like the Maven central or any, like there's no centralized way of getting the dependencies, People get those dependencies and then they actually commit them as part of their project, right? They don't expect the users of their projects to install them. <laughs> okay. So, so basically, that's what's going on in the JavaScript world. Like, and tell me, ask me more about uh, what's going on in here because it's an interesting. So, David is telling me that I have five minutes, so I really have to speed up. Uh, we also have the results for again JavaScript. This is the project level duplication. This is how how many projects are complete overlap, so this is the 100%. Uh, overlap at 80% and overlap at 50%. <coughs> so this is how many files are the same uh, in, in the different ecosystems. Again, JavaScript is, uh, is, there's a fair amount of overlap of the entire projects. So uh, what we're doing right now, we're developing a web service that uh, if you, the idea is if you, if you it paste in a URL of a file in GitHub, it tells you all of the files that are <coughs> duplicates according to the, you know, you have check boxes of exact duplication or token hash duplication or near duplication. So it, it shows you uh, all of that. And we are continuing to make performance improvements on the clone detection tool. That's an ever ongoing project. There's never ending to performance improvements of these, these tools that they have to um, in, ingest uh, large, large amounts of data. So uh, another tool that we are working on is the Java build framework. And the idea is that, well, we have JavaScript, right? We have, we have GitHub. We have the entirety, you know, you name it, half a million projects in Java. And now we actually would like to do something with them. And we would like to do something with them in terms of uh, static analysis and dynamic analysis, too. We want to also have dynamic analysis. But in order to have dynamic analysis, we have to have the bytecodes. <coughs> so we need to build these things. And many of these, most of the, well, a considerable number of these projects don't come with built um, <coughs> scripts. And even if they come with built scripts, we actually don't want to use them, and I'll tell you why. So basically, we build a, 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 this Java uh, build framework that, uh, that is able of uh, compiling a um, big amount of source code. And I'll, I'll tell you how it works. Let me tell you the results. Uh, right now, we have a success rate of 54%. So we are able to compile 54% of that large amount of Java projects. And this is basically pretty much ignoring their build scripts. Um, we have a bunch of failures over here, uh, and we are going. We are working on improving. There's some correlation with build failures and the size of the project. This is what this means over here. So the larger the project, the more likely it is that they fail to to, to compile, which kind of makes sense. Uh, they usually tend to have more complicated dependencies, and uh, most of the problems with building is the dependencies, finding the right dependencies. So. Uh, we, we looked into whether we would have better results if we would use their, the project's build, build scripts. And uh, so there's about 47% 40, of the projects don't have any build scripts at all. Then there's the other ones that have about 15%, Ant, Maven, and Gradle. And so we, we actually run it once to, to try to see what we would end up with. There's definitely some improvement if we would look only at the data set that has build scripts, so those 53% of the projects, those you would get better results if you use their build scripts. 
But if you look at the entire thing, it includes the 47% that don't have build scripts. So we still win. So we still have, you know, 57, 54% success whether if we would just use their own, we would get only 30%. Mm -hmm. So, and, and now we are improving the, our, um, uh, our framework to build, to actually perform better. But the, the problem with the own builds is that it's a big security and um, risk. So we, when we run these crazy things of using their own build files, we ended up with uh, these the scripts <coughs> wanting to do SSH to random IP addresses over the network, wanting to download those sorts of crazy things. The, the files, the, <coughs> our local file system got littered with trash. You know, with files called C colon backslash blah blah blah. <laughs> There's a whole sorts of things that happen when you actually. So it's it's actually we don't want to run the projects on this. It's a very, very dangerous. <coughs> and and there's a lot of variation of actions, not just compilation. And we are when we are focused on actually compilation. So and uh, the builds takes much longer too. If we let their own builds take much longer, our our builds are much faster. So it, it, it like eighty seconds versus twenty twenty um, eighty sorry eight, eight seconds, seconds for uh, for us versus twenty seconds for using them. All right. So let me just um, conclude here with two observations about the bad things of doing research with big data and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish with the good things of research with big data. So the, the bad things that these are very, very, very large data sets and they're very difficult to handle and to share. So <coughs> we, when we downloaded GitHub, it took us what, like two months, three months, I don't even remember, to actually download the entire thing. It just takes a very long time. Um, and, and now we are working with this CLI. We're, we're doing this uh, project with them, and we, they also want to have large numbers of projects, and again, it takes a very long time to. The next time that we share something with them, they're going to have to send us a hard drive by mail, and we copy, and they will send it back, because uh, that's the fastest way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, uh, it requires expensive hardware, or, uh, so my approach here, uh, uh, like Owen, I, I, I tried to use MapReduce and my students were very <coughs> excited with MapReduce solutions and even with cluster solutions. One of my students was absolutely in love with the cluster that we have, scientific uh, computing that we have here, tried to use it. And I was always, uh, I don't think so. Basically, <laughs> if we have the money, buying a big server with a lot of cores and a lot of memory, that's the way to go. You basically avoid all the complication of map reducing things, <laughs> right? So that's, you know, as, as far as I can get DARPA to, to give me money to buy the ser uh, server like the one that I just bought now, which is the, the big, biggest machine I ever had, 112 cores and 500 and, and, uh, and uh, 12 gig of RAM, why would I care about MapReduce? <laughs> it's just, I, I can fix If everything. you can buy the one machine, yes, you don't care. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so, so uh, but, but again, it requires, it does require money. These machines are not cheap. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, my col colleague at UCLA does not have one of these machines. And, and there's not a lot of people in research who have th these machines either. So we can do it, can do stuff like this because we have this machine. But uh, actually, last six months ago, we could not do it because I didn't have this machine. We were running already. The fastest machine that I had was not <coughs> able to, to cope with this. So uh, the processing, even with these machines, can take forever. And so ex uh, uh, <coughs> mistakes are very expensive. You know, it's very easy for a student to be doing something, and then two days later found that it's, it was wrong, and there goes two days of, of his or her time. Um, but the, the bottom here is that the scientific insights don't necessarily require big data. And that's one interesting thing that we recently found out. You know, first of all, for the Java builds, uh, we processing about, you know, with 10% of the projects processed, we were, it was already converging to the final number. You know, the 54%, the, we were already seeing that ratio on, with 10% of the projects. So we don't necessarily, so for these insights, sampling actually works. The statisticians tell us that you know that sampling works, and we kind of find, oh, really? But it does, actually does. It does. So we don't necessarily need big data. But the good thing is that uh, the useful <coughs> applications require the whole data. So things like, for example, the map that we're doing in GitHub. If we don't have the entire <laughs> GitHub, then that tool is meaningless, right? If we if we want to do the tool that tracks who's using my project, if we don't have the entire GitHub, then you, you don't you can't do it, right? You can do a proof of concept, but you cannot you cannot do the, the tool. 
And, and so scale presents interesting new challenges, engineering challenges. Some of them are actually quite worthy of doctoral investigation, in the, you know, in terms of performance, in terms of the architecture. Uh, so, so these are sort of the pros and the cons of using big data for doing research. And um, David is going to kick me out, so. <laughs> well, uh, reluctantly, I mean, it's very <laughs> fascinating. Let's thank Krista. We can have a couple of questions while our next speaker uh, sets up. Uh, the comment that you know, <laughs> scientific insight does not uh, can come from sampling. I would encourage you to publish a small uh, article on that for, the, for many other fields. It's true for in many, many fields. Yeah, I, so I, I send it to the New York Times or LA Times. <laughs> <or whatever. laughs> definitely, definitely. I mean, this, this is, we learned it the hard way because we, we sometimes we, we uh, spent a lot of time crunching all this data, but it's pretty clear that with, the, with a small fraction of the time, we were already seeing the final thing. So it's just a matter of how, whether your sampling is correctly sampling the data or not. So two thoughts. One, given that most of your, or at least a large portion of your duplication is from libraries, it seems that using the file name as an initial filter would, would be very useful. It might, yeah. And, and the, the other is, um, it's a bit more memory intensive, but if you use suffix trees rather than hash codes to do your comparisons, you can actually get very large matches much more easily and quickly. So, so, so sorceress you see, we use a variation of suffix trees. And that's the part that I didn't go into. Uh, the clone the detection tools that does those kind of more subtle uh, overlaps of tokens. But, but we had, but before we even do that, there's the simpler thing, which is the hash, the file hashes and the token hashes. And we thought we needed to do those filters first. Like I said, it takes more memory, but the order of time is the same. So. Okay, I'll be happy to talk more. Oh, 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 Andre. So, one question that I have is, with these findings, how does that now translate for me as a software developer? Are, are, you, are you interested in this, or what's the long-term agenda here? What, what do you want to be able to tell me as somebody in the industry? Well, it depends on the project, right? It depends on the study. So the clone duplication study was pretty much that it's pretty useful for the people who are doing using GitHub data for machine learning, for example. Right. If you're doing machine, if you're trying to do program repair and you're trying to train the network, then at the very least you need to be aware that like 93% of JavaScript is duplicated. You know, so you're basically learning the, the libraries of, of Node, which is maybe what you want or not, but at least you need to be aware. So that's one, that sort of awareness is one thing. For the, the, the Java build framework, uh, it's Again, it's, we're trying to, basically the goal there is to be able to compile projects without necessarily uh, having any dependency annotation whatsoever, right? So ignore, all, but but basically if you want to build some project that you got somewhere, the engineers got away, the dependency documentation is all non-existent, can you still build it, <laughs> right? So we could build a tool that, that, that basically would be able to do that. So that's the idea.